live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe. All right, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, welcome to the Science Cafe. Thank you very much. Uh, so for those of you who are well, uh, uh, used to seeing Brian Mallow, I am not Brian Mallow as you may already have uh, determined. My name is Jason Krein. I'm Deputy Museum Director and, and Chief of Research and Collections here. And so it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, who I will introduce in just a few seconds. But there's some other little announcements that I'd like to make before we start. Uh, number one is tonight is the last night that we're uh, keeping the other building, this building open at, in the evenings. We will be continuing Science Cafe, so don't worry about that. But in the, in the future, you'll have to come into the, the building, this or the cafe, through these doors here, this one and the one in the back. So uh, just remember that we do still have science cafes. We're just closing the other building, and, and you'll just be able to enter here. The second thing that's kind of exciting that's happening tonight is we have a couple of poets here tonight. So over here at this, uh, this table over here, we have people from the Living Poetry Group. Uh, in particular, we've got Bartholomew Barker. Hey, Bart. We've got Tara Lynn Groth, we have Angie Kirby, and Anna Weaver. And they're going to be going uh, to listen tonight very assiduously, and they're going to be taking notes, and they're going to be composing poets, uh, poems. And they'll be then reciting those poems at the end of our program for everyone's pleasure. So welcome to you all. Thank you. So tonight's speaker is, uh, is a friend of the museum. His name is Dr. Charles Nunn. He's a professor of evolutionary anthropology at Duke University. He's also with the, the Duke Global Health Institute. And he's uh, here tonight. He's also the director of the uh, TRISEM, which is a Triangle Center of Evolutionary Medicine, uh, a, a really interesting uh, collaborative group that's starting here, forming here in the Triangle. Uh, he's, he, um, in particular, studies evolution in the ecology of, of disease, uh, and particularly with primates. And, uh, but with other animals as well. Uh, and he's also done quite a bit of research in sleep and the evolution and ecology of sleep and how it, how it reflects uh, human disease and, and potential disease. So, so Charlie is going to come and, and speak with us for a while, then we'll take your questions and have a great discussion. Charlie. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you Jason. So I'm really excited to be here and have an opportunity to talk about some of the work that we're doing on uh, the ecology and evolution of sleep. Now, as humans, we often ponder the pleasures of life, right? Like food and drink, uh, travel, spending time with family, you know, the feeling of falling in love, all of these great pleasures, right, that we could enumerate. I would argue that one of the greatest pleasures in life that's often forgotten is sleep. When there's nothing as satisfying as sleep, when you're truly exhausted, right? That feeling of climbing into bed and putting your head down and falling asleep is pure bliss. And we see this in some extreme cases, okay? Here's an image of Peter Tripp. Peter Tripp. Um, he was a DJ in the 1950s in New York, and he held what he called a wake a thon a publicity stunt, a fundraising stunt, in which he tried to stay awake as long as he could on the air. He was on the air the whole time. For eight days, he stayed awake, okay? Um, and people said he was never quite the same afterwards, okay? Um, and I think the most remarkable thing about this is other people came along and actually beat this record, okay? This was a record for a while, and I can't imagine why anyone would want to do that, um, but people did. Um, now, on a less extreme scale, I would bet that everyone in this room has the same pattern I have, which is I sleep too little during the week, and then I have to catch up on sleep on the weekend, right? We stay up late, we have to get up early, and then we catch up on sleep on the weekend. And if we don't get that catch-up sleep, it's misery on Monday, right? Monday comes. Now, you know, what this means is sleep really presents a kind of paradox, right? It's this thing that we love, Yet, we always seem to have something better to do than to sleep, right? It's, it's something we can put off um, or even wish we could get rid of, right? How many times have you heard people say, I wish I could function on less sleep? Um, and so there's this kind of love-hate relationship with sleep. Um, and today, I want to I talk about some work that's emerging out of my research group somewhat unexpectedly in just the last year. 
that's really suggesting that this love-hate relationship is not just something that's a, a product of our Western lifestyles with our iPhones and televisions and social media and all these other things. That's what the sleep medicine community suggests, right? And there's probably some truth to that. Instead, I want to show you some results that are suggesting that evolution has been hard at work at shaping human sleep, probably for millions of years, that there's been some really extreme evolution along this branch leading to humans. Now, um, I have an outline for you to help us through this material. Um, I want to start off at a really broad scale. I want to tell you about some of the work I've done in the past on mammals and the factors that influence sleep across mammals and give you at least a little taste for the kind of variation we see across species in sleep, okay? And then we're going to narrow in on the great apes. And I want to tell you a few things about the great apes that you may not appreciate um, that uh, relate to our sleep today, okay? Then finally, we'll get to the what you're all probably interested in, sleep in humans, and what's happened to our sleep relative to other primates. So, you know, first of all, there's incredible variation in sleep patterns across mammals, well, and as well as other organisms. But today, we're only going to think about mammals. Tonight, we're only going to think about mammals. And so you can see that there are some real expert sleepers among the mammals, right? Like this bat that sleeps for roughly 20 hours. And, you know, other organisms that sleep very little. Okay, so here at the bottom, I guess this pointer is not going to work, but at the bottom right, you see a giraffe. Okay, this is a giraffe in REM sleep. Okay, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when, of course, the most vivid dreaming occurs. And, you know, if you slept like that, you probably wouldn't sleep very long either, right? Um, so it makes some sense. The, one of the key things to notice on this is primates are sort of average sleepers. Okay, we sleep, you know, most primates will sleep between 9 and 13 hours. Okay. All right, so gives you a little bit of a sense of the variation. Now, there's all kinds of other types of variation we can talk about. You know, how do aquatic mammals sleep? I mean, we have time for questions at the end if people are curious about some of that. Um, we could, you know, there's also the phasing of sleep, right? Do animals sleep in one bout or do they sleep in many? Again, there are all kinds of fascinating questions we can ask about the evolution of these different patterns. Um, now, when I started this work um, about 10 years ago, we wanted to really understand variation in just total sleep duration. What explains the kind of variation I showed on that previous slide, okay? And so we quickly realized that there were two types of hypotheses, two sets of hypotheses that are relevant here. Some have to do with ecology, right? For some animals, they just don't have time to sleep. Right, because there are other things in their lives that keep them from sleeping, predation, for example. Okay? And there were other hypotheses that related more to the functional benefits of sleep. Right? We often hear sleep is for the brain, you know, for example. So perhaps animals with larger brains need more sleep. Okay? So we organize the hypotheses into these ecological constraints hypotheses and functional benefits hypotheses, right? Here's that one I just mentioned, memory consolidation. Animals with larger brains have to sleep more, for example, okay? Now, um, I don't want to walk you through all of these, and of course there are other hypotheses I could put up here, uh, but I just want to give you a sense for the big take-home message, which is that the variation we see across species seems to be, in, in sleep durations, seems to be driven by ecology rather than functional benefits. And this is important for later parts of my talk. So, for example, here I show, I'm showing some of the results from our work looking at exposure at the sleep site. This is a risk of predation at the place where the mammal sleeps, okay? And the amount, the duration of non-REM and REM sleep that we see in those different species. Now, you might be wondering about the axes here. They're sort of centered on zero. That's because we're actually looking at evolutionary change on a phylogeny. We're showing with this that where there's evolutionary increases in the risk of predation, there are decreases in the amount of sleep for both non-REM and for REM. Okay. Now, um, we also have looked at trophic level, for example, right? Um, whether you're a predator or prey, okay, for example. And we find, again, the same kind of pattern. Carnivores sleep more than herbivores, okay? Anybody who has a cat, you know, has a good sense of that. 
Um, now, in contrast, if we look at some of the functional benefits of sleep, right, like brain size, we fail to find very compelling associations between brain size and sleep. Sort of a surprise, really. Okay. Um, also, we, you know, because we were surprised by this, we thought, well, let's look at particular parts of the brain, right, like the hippocampus, the site of uh, where many spatial memories are stored, right? And so looking across species, do animals with a larger hippocampus sleep more? No association there, okay? We found some slight associations with the amygdala, but not very compelling, okay? And we actually predicted that this would be with REM, not with non-REM sleep. So overall, we don't find much evidence for these kind of functional benefits explaining total sleep time. Instead, it looks like ecological factors are the main driver of sleep durations. Okay? And we can talk a little bit more about whether these functional benefits are relevant or not in the question session if people are interested. But in short, we find evidence for ecology being the primary shaper of sleep. Okay? And we're going to see that that's relevant as well for humans. Okay? A little bit of evidence for infectious disease risk. Okay, so now let's move on you know, to the great apes. And I have a question for you guys. What is the one behavioral trait, and I think this is the only behavioral trait, I haven't yet had anyone come up with another one, the one behavioral trait that unites the great apes, that all great apes have, but no other primates have. Anybody know what that is? I'm sorry? Opposable thumb is one. Um, no, that's... Tools, okay, other, other primates use tools, so capuchins. Um, and bipedal, well, not all of them are bipedal, so the chimpanzee, I mean, they can, you know, we do have a picture here of one walking bipedally, but they tend to knuckle walk. Humans are the only of the groups that are, you know, well adapted to bipedalism. One last one, sorry. Uh, many other primates live on the ground, baboons, for example, uh, live on the ground. Many other species come to the ground. How about the tail? The tail? Well, they lack a tail. <laughs> but so do the gibbons. <laughs> and so do some macaques. Um, and it's not a behavior. A tail is not a behavior. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, the, the, the behavioral trait I'm after is that we all, all great apes, build a bed, a platform, a sleeping platform, or a nest. So, you know, the orangutan, the gorilla, chimpanzee, every night before they go to sleep, they create a bed. They climb into a tree. They're already in the tree often, in any case. They, it's a very sophisticated process of folding over the branches, and they make a very stable platform in which they can lie and sleep. Okay. Uh, of course, the youngest ones don't do it. The mothers do that for them. Um, but every animal makes its own bed. Every adult or, or juvenile makes its own bed, and they do this every night. Okay. Now, why is that? Um, one factor is probably body mass, okay? The great apes are larger in body size, right? It's, you know, think about trying to sleep on a branch. You know, that would be hard for us. We're big-bodied animals, right? Um, whereas a monkey, a small-bodied monkey, you could imagine that happening a lot more easily. And, in fact, we've looked at this more formally. Um, my postdoc, David Sampson, and I have looked at this. You have some species, like these mouse lemurs, aren't they cute, on the left there? that um, they use existing locations to sleep. So they're not building a nest, right? And they're very small. They can find those locations and sleep in them. That's ideal if you can do it, right? It provides thermic regulatory benefits, protection from the rain, from mosquitoes, you know, all the things that you have to deal with in a tropical rainforest. The, the middle, where you see B, are the, the monkeys, right? And, and the gibbons, the lesser apes. They sleep on tree branches. They can, you know, lie in various ways or on cliffs, on the face of a cliff. And, in fact, there are reports of them falling out of these trees at night, okay? It's probably not that easy to do. Um, and then, finally, and you can see the body mass, okay? They're larger in body size than those mouse lemurs. And then you can see the great apes, okay? And here's where we have the really large-bodied animals. And they need, they probably need to build a nest if they're going to stay up in the tree throughout the night. Right, without being on the ground. Now, um, there's 
Also, probably another factor at play here, at least there's a hypothesis out there, that maybe these sleeping platforms are important for great ape cognitive ability and performance. Because great apes, as you guys know, also have bigger brains, right? We have, you know, if you look at all the primates, the great ape and controlling for body size, the great apes are above the other primates. And of course, humans are above, you know, a big even for a great ape. Um, and so maybe, you know, you need, we all have that perception, right, that we need a good night's sleep to be functional the next day cognitively. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they build these nests. Uh, well, again, the postdoc uh, in my lab, before he came to my lab, actually investigated this. This is, again, David Sampson. And David did his Ph.D. work um, at University of Indiana, and he studied the primates at the Indiana Zoo. And what you see here is a, uh, an orangutan in the front on that pink blanket, okay? And if you look at the back there, you're seeing a baboon, okay, crouched. So these are two animals sleeping, and the baboon is sleeping in the crouched position, as they do, whereas look at that orangutan, right, stretched out, you know, probably snoring away. Um, they give the animals the material to build a nest every night. On this night, they, they gave, them this, gave this animal this blanket. The animal folds it up in this way and lies down on it and goes to sleep. Now, when, when I look at this, and I'm somebody who travels a lot, I, I see, you know, it looks like that orangutan is sleeping in first class on the airplane to Europe, you know, whereas the baboon's back where I am in, economy, in the economy section, right? And um, David actually showed that orangutans have first-class sleep. He measured the quality of their sleep using, he videotaped them and then scored it carefully for movements of various kinds and other ways, there are other ways to score sleep. And he showed, for example, that the orangutan has lower sleep fragmentation. Okay, this is the number of, I believe the measure he had is the number of, of um, times awake of duration two minutes or more per hour, okay? So you can see that the baboon is awake a lot. There's a lot more motor activity. It has to do a lot more to keep its, its balance sleeping in that crouched position than the orangutan does, you know, sleeping totally stretched out, as this one does. Um, okay, so he took it a step further, and he realized, I can give these animals different materials that would make, you know, the nest better or worse, okay, depending on what he provides for these animals. And so he came up with the sleep comfort index, which is simply a score of what material he provided to these animals. Okay? So number one, or zero, yeah, zero, is just straw. No blankets, no nothing for the animals. Okay? And then as you go up, it's like pillows and blankets, and you know, the top one has like foam pads of various kinds that the animals can orient however they want to do this. And he showed that the the, the fragmentation declines with the quality of the nest, okay, that these animals have. And he took that then one step further, and with some people who are doing some cognitive testing with these animals, okay, in particular grammar tasks where they have to get things in the right order, he showed that the animals have higher accuracy on this test once they, when they have more of these materials and, and lower sleep fragmentation. So this translates into higher cognitive function. When, they when they're able to lie down in a, in a better nest and get better sleep. The same perception we have, and of course there are many studies on humans that show that this is true as well for us. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we, um, you know, this is great. This is a great first study. I don't think anyone else has done anything like this. But of course we want to understand how general this is. Is this really something that only happens in the great apes? That's sort of the hypothesis here. Or is it something that happens in all animals, um, all primates in our case? So we're actually now looking at this, looking at these sleep cognition links. And Gibbons, that's a lesser ape, okay? And so they sleep crouched on the branches, like, I, like the baboon I showed you. Gorillas, uh, we have a project starting up this fall at the, the North Carolina Zoo to study the gorillas there. And especially we're studying this in lemurs, where we're even sleep depriving some of the lemurs to see how that affects their next day cognition. So in all of these cases, we're really trying to flesh out this pattern and, well, whether there is a pattern across the whole tree of primates, okay? All right, so 
What about sleeping humans? Let's drill down now into that human lineage, our lineage. And what we really want to ask here, what I want to ask, is how does human sleep differ from other primates? And we can see right away there are some differences. We know there are some differences, right? Uh, this is a Hadza man, by the way, uh, sleeping. Uh, you can see there's a nest, a platform, a bed, right? Whatever you want to call it. Um, they often have a special thing that they put underneath them. It's, it can be a, like a hardened hide uh, of an animal. Okay, these are hunter-gatherers living in Africa, okay? They have blankets, of course. As you can see, they often sleep by a fire. They're sleeping on the ground. Okay, that's pretty unusual, actually. Um, the great apes, most of them are sleeping in the trees. Some really large-bodied male gorillas will sleep on the ground. But basically, you know, sleeping on the ground is something pretty unusual. Um, so, you know, obviously there are a lot of ways that human sleep is different. There's no other primate that has a fire by its sleeping site, of course. Um, but I want to really draw your attention to, to thinking about more quantitative aspects of sleep uh, involving sleep duration and how much of the time humans are spending in REM sleep, that rapid eye movement sleep. So let's think about that more quantitatively. Um, here's um, one result I want to share with you. Um, this shows the total sleep time of the primates that have been studied, okay? Um, and what you can see is that humans are the shortest sleeping of the primates. Remember I said primates are sort of average sleepers. Well, humans are, are, are outside that average. Uh, we're very short in the amount of time we spend sleep. It, it's a very short night compared to the other primates, okay? Um, you might wonder what value would we use for humans for, for sleep? Um, we use, in this case, seven hours okay, as our number for human sleep. That's based on studies of humans in, uh, well, the hunter-gatherers, I just showed you, the Hadza have been studied, um, people in traditional societies without access to electricity. The number comes out to about six and a half to seven hours. And that's not far off from what you see in Western societies either. If you look across a population, it's a little bit more than seven hours, okay. Um, and I'll just say all the results I'm gonna present next, which are going to start to be a little more quantitative, are robust to any number we use up to about eight hours. Okay. So we're, we're the shortest sleeping of all primates. But how, you know, as a scientist, we need to, we can't just put bars up here. We need to know um, what's really expected. Is this more deviant than you would expect? Is it significant? You know, however you want to frame that, right? And so we've been developing some techniques in my lab um, that enable us to really discern whether a single species, humans is what we're focusing on in all of our studies, whether humans are really different from what you'd expect, okay? Different from what you'd expect if humans were just a typical primate, okay? So let me, I'm not gonna show you any of the equations or other things because I want you to actually stay awake tonight, okay? And I want them to actually put this video online instead of just, you know, throwing it in the garbage. Um, now, I think many of you know about work in evolutionary biology where people try to reconstruct an ancestral state, right? So, for example, I have a question mark on this phylogeny of primates where, you know, it might be somebody wanting to reconstruct the, the root node, the ancestral primate, or something, okay? And we realize, well, you can look at this at any node on the tree, right? So we could look at the great apes and reconstruct that. And we reasoned, well, why not actually put this on the tip of the tree? What if we actually reconstructed what humans would look like um, based on the variation across other primates? And we then took it another step further and we said, well, we can use phylogeny to make an inference of the human phenotype at that tip. But we can also bring in all the ecological factors that I was mentioning earlier in my talk that also influence sleep, like predation risk and brain size and, and other things. And so we can actually make an estimate for what human sleep would look like if we were a typical primate, given the ecological and phenoty other phenotypic characters we have, okay? So that's all we're doing here. We're using Bayesian phylogenetic methods and statistical methods to do that. And I want to show you, when we do that, what we predict human sleep duration would be, okay? And so we end up with what's called a distribution of values, a posterior distribution of values. As you can see on this slide, this is the predicted sleep dur duration. The mean of this is 10.3 hours. So it predicts, our model predicts that humans would sleep 10.3 hours 
given our body mass and all of our other characteristics. And for those of you that are interested, that's the equation below there, the statistical model we use to make this prediction combined with phylogeny. Okay, phylogeny is a variable in there. And what you see with the red bar is the observed value. And you can see that that observed value is very far outside. Well, it's, there's one data point less than it, actually, in that posterior distribution. But it's, it's obviously outside what you would call a credible, a 95% credible interval on that distribution. So humans are extreme. We, have, we sleep less than we would predict based on our characteristics and phylogeny. So we can really nail this down quantitatively. Okay. Um, now, here's the second result I want to share with you. And this has to do with REM sleep, that rapid eye movement sleep. Um, here again is the, are the values across primates, okay? Humans have the highest proportion of REM sleep, not the absolute amount of REM, okay? There are other primates that have more REM, okay? But the proportion of the time spent in REM is the highest for humans, okay? Now, here it's not quite so clear whether humans are extreme, and that's where those methods are especially important, right? To, to figure out whether humans are more extreme. And as you can see, again, we're finding that humans depart from that predicted distribution, okay? Now, I should have said on the last slide, we're transforming this in various ways. This is a logic transformation. So the, the numbers themselves aren't going to mean much. You can't have a negative 1% you know, percentage of REM. But what you can see is that humans are more extreme than you would predict, okay? In this case, on the high end, okay? All right. Now, why? Why is this? And again, this comes back, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier with ecology being so important. Um, we think, you know, our proposal is that throughout human evolution, not just today, we've had a lot better things to do than sleep. Um, this is not something that's just unique to those of us in Western societies. Um, and again, these eco so again, these kind of ecological factors and constraints reign supreme as we propose explaining these very short durations and high percentage of REM. Um, and so some of the potential selective forces that might be operating on a hominin living in a terrestrial environment and sleeping in that terrestrial environment are involve the following. Okay, greater predation risk sleeping on the ground. That's dangerous. Okay, it's known that the predation risk is higher if you're sleeping on the ground than in a tree. Okay. Um, greater opportunity um, for <coughs> Inter and intra group conflict, which characterizes many human societies, often a lot of conflict between groups. Um, and being on the ground could make you vulnerable to attack at night, let's say. So, probably a lot of humans would have better things to do than sleep if you're faced with this kind of risk. Okay? Um, as well, the benefits of social interaction. So, it's not just about these kind of pure constraints. We have better things to do, including social interactions with others that can improve reproductive fitness, okay? And as well, the benefit from a quite, uh, sort of related to that point, the, the benefits of being awake to learn new things, especially through social learning, you know, which is really what has made us such a successful species, um, colonizing the globe in roughly, you know, 50,000 years. Um, this kind of knowledge that has to be learned and passed on and developed. So our argument is we've had better things to do than sleep, and it's not a modern uh, phenomenon. Um, now, I have a third point I want to make, and it's really more of a hypothesis because we don't have the kind of quantitative data to back this up yet. But uh, David Sampson and I also propose <coughs> that natural human sleep is more flexible than that of other great apes. And I just want to point you to some of the evidence that leads us to this hypothesis. Okay. Um, one has to do with hunter-gatherers. People who work with hunter-gatherers describe how difficult it is to, to live with them because they're awake all the time. There's somebody always awake, okay? That's what people say. Um, here's just an example. This is from Daniel Everett's work on a South American hunter-gatherer group, the Paraha. He writes, Paraha take naps 15 minutes to two hours at the extreme during the day and night. There is loud talking in the village all night long. Consequently, it's very hard for outsiders to sleep among the Paraha, okay? And he complains throughout the book about the difficulty of sleeping with the Paraha. Um, that's, you know, one society, um, but Carol Worthman, who's an anthropologist at Emory um, and who's studied sleep cross-culturally, 
um, is really the expert on this topic, uh, writes that and in a summary of all the evidence that she looked at, human nights are filled with activity and significance, and nowhere do people typically sleep from evening to dawn. Um, likewise, some of you might know about uh, Roger E. Kirch's work. He's, an, he's a historian at, I believe, Virginia Tech. Um, and he's looked at the historical record, uh, focusing especially on Europe, and he discovered many references to first sleep and second sleep um, with a period of night of activity between them. And he documented this in many different uh, European cultures, also some other cultures in Africa, um, and, um, you know, proposes that that's probably a natural pattern of human sleep, to have this kind of interval sleep or, or segmented sleep, people call it. Um, and as, as well, there have been experimental studies where people are put into a you know, short daylight, long night uh, sort of photo period. And in one of these studies, um, the author documented that many of the participants shift this kind of biphasic segmented sleep pattern. Okay. So there's no doubt. Other primates are active at night. You know, I showed you the work that David did. I mean, they they're are active at night. There are periods of activity even for other great apes. Okay. Um, but we're proposing that humans are more flexible than most other primates. And that has, is yet to be tested, but we think it's an interesting and viable hypothesis. Okay. All right, so I have a few take-home messages <clears throat> for you all, and then I hope we can open it up to some discussion. I can't wait to hear the poems. I hope that's um, going uh, well. Um, I can't, you know, I, I, I find it stressful to give a talk and to get prepared for it mentally in the moment. I can't imagine trying to write a, a poem. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that now. Oh, I see. Well, line helps. Okay. Yes, I, I should have tried that. That would have been good. Okay. Um, so I have three take-home messages, one for each of the sections of my talk, okay, which I hope you'll take home with you. Um, the first is that ecology seems to be the major driver of variation in mammalian sleep architecture, okay? Um, the second has to do with the great apes, right? The great apes are really expert nest builders, and a good night's sleep enables, uh, a good nest enables deeper sleep and probably better cognitive performance. We don't know whether that's limited to the great apes, but we're working really hard to figure that out, okay? And then finally, we're proposing that humans are exceptional in three ways. Okay, we sleep less than would be predicted, given our characteristics, and given the variation in other primates. We sleep a lot less. Um, we have a higher percentage of REM sleep, and that might be involved with memory consolidation uh, related to social learning and other things, okay? Um, and then finally, we may be, and this is a proposal, we may be more flexible in our sleep. Okay. Now, um, you know, some of you might be wondering, um, gosh, maybe this is, you know, my excuse to not sleep so much, you know? I'm a busy person, and you know, the, the data from hunter gatherers uh, that came out, three different hunter gatherer groups, is that they spend six and a half hours a night asleep on average. That's the mean, okay? And that's based on actigraphy, so it's definitely an overestimate, right? So, natural human sleep, if you think hunter gatherers exhibit that, which is plausible, would be about six to six and a half hours a night, okay? So, you might be thinking, well, hey, I finally got my excuse to, you know, burn the candle at both ends. Um, you know, and so there are some people who propose paleo sleep. I don't actually know what that means in the context of what's in, you know, on the internet. <clears throat> but um, based on what we know about hunter-gatherers and the kinds of studies I've done, paleo sleep would be short and fragmented sleep, okay? It would not be what you would call a good night's sleep. Now, um, this really, um, you know, relates to a central, central tenet of evolutionary medicine. Um, and that is that natural selection operates on reproductive success, right? It doesn't operate on health. And so I would argue that this kind of paleo sleep, this kind of short fragmented sleep, might be very good. It might have been very good for our, our um, reproductive success in the past, but it's pro it probably had many detrimental effects on health. In fact, we know that short sleep is associated with cardiovascular disease, higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Short sleep is associated with diabetes, obesity. Um, a typical sleep is associated with higher rates of cancer, right? So if you're in this for health, if you're interested in health, you should not pursue the paleo sleep diet. If reproductive success is more important to you, 
maybe this is a good option. Okay. Um, now, as well, um, I wanted to have a, take a moment and just introduce you to this concept of evolutionary medicine, this idea that we can understand something about human health by understanding our evolutionary past and understanding evolution in general. <clears throat> and um, as, as Jason mentioned at the beginning of uh, when he was introducing me, um, I'm also director of this Triangle Center for Evolutionary Medicine here in the Triangle, which aims to connect evolutionary biologists with those in public health and medicine and the vet school down at NC State. Um, and we're also trying to do this with the example of sleep. So, <clears throat> in particular, I'm working with Andrew Crystal uh, at Duke uh, in the School of Medicine. Andrew Phillips um, up at the uh, Harvard School, uh, Harvard Medical School, in the Sleep Biology Group, um, and we're working on understanding various kinds of sleep disorders in an evolutionary context. As you can see, we have a manuscript um, that's uh, being revised right now for the journal Evolution Medicine and Public Health. There is such a journal, believe it or not. Um, and we're also very, very interested in global health and thinking about the global health implications of sleep. And so, in particular, how do sleep patterns change as people gain access to artificial lighting? And does poor sleep actually cause some of the health disparities that we see globally? Uh, things like higher rates of uh, obesity that we're seeing, the very rapid rates, uh, re increases in hypertension that we're seeing in low- and middle-income countries uh, as they develop, et cetera. And to do this, we're actually studying sleep in these societies. Um, here's some work we're doing in Madagascar. Um, this is a picture from last year where we actually even got polysomnography, uh, EEG data from people living in this village, a village with no electricity and no running water. Um, and we also get actigraphy data. Those are the kind of devices you wear on your wrist. Probably some of you have Fitbits and things like that. But these are sophisticated um, medical-grade actigraphy devices. And what we found really surprised us. We figured that these folks might actually sleep more than those in the West. That was one hypothesis, right? Because they don't have access to electricity. And this is winter when they have long nights in this population. Instead, we found that they had tremendously short and fragmented nights. The paleo sleep diet is what they are adhering to. Very low sleep efficiency, very high sleep fragmentation, and about six and a half hours of sleep a night. Again, people around the world whatever their circumstances, have better things to do than sleep. Now, we're investigating what this might mean for their health as well. What we know is that the, this population has a, a rate of hypertension of about 30%, um, despite no obvious dietary or other factors that, are, you know, that would put them at risk of hypertension. And so we're exploring, could this sleep, the sleep patterns that they're having, the sleep challenges that they're having, and they report sleep challenges, actually be played a role in some of the non-communicable diseases that we're seeing in this population and throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, okay so um, that just is trying to connect this kind of evolutionary perspective I shared with you with real-world health issues, um, both here you know, domestically in our country, but also internationally in other circumstances. And I think we're really at the, the edge of knowledge here, you know, in terms of what this might mean. And I can talk about the hypotheses we have for why they're sleeping so little, if anyone's interested. So with that, I'll say thank you all for staying awake. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or carry on the conversation. Well, let's give Dr. Nunn a great round of applause. Thank you. So very good. That, that fascinating stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and take some questions from the, from the group. Okay. Thanks for mentioning the first sleep, second sleep. I saw some comments about this. Oh, saw some comments about this as the settlers moved west of the United States. My question, though, is from a psychologist, uh, you mentioned that OCD people sometimes don't get much sleep, so they medicate. For one reason, so they get at least three hours sleep. Your comment on not having sleep being detrimental to your health is what I got from this person. So if you take sleeping aids, pills, to sleep seven hours, is that as good a sleep as your natural sleep? 
Well, so, you know, I'm an evolutionary biologist, not an expert in sleep medicine, so I, I should, you know, probably should have prefaced this entire conversation with that. Um, but, you know, what I am aware of are, are many studies showing that uh, use of, of sleeping aids actually is associated with higher rates of mortality and, and disease. Um, now, I don't know that anyone's made the comparison, um, you know, exactly to if you took them or if you didn't, you know, in relation to a specific disease. Um, you know, maybe those people would have higher mortality anyhow, right, given the, the challenges that they have but uh, with sleeping. But, you know, I, I can't speak to the pharmaceutical, you know, pharmacological effects of these drugs on sleep. Um, you know, certainly there are, you know, it depends on the drug you're talking about, and, and some do have serious side effects. So, yes? Thanks for a very interesting presentation. I was happy to see the emphasis on the ecological factors behind variation in sleep duration quality, um, but I'm wondering if I can push you to include in people's environments um, uh, aspects that human beings have been responsible for themselves. Um, so, and I don't know that this is, these may be too recent to have shown up much in evolutionary terms, but I'm thinking of um, the rise of agriculture and the demands that um, systematic agriculture put on people's daily activities and their opportunities for sleep. I'm thinking of the rise, the, the spread, rise and spread of capitalism as a way of organizing societies, which uh, makes people's time something that gets counted and gets used and gets paid for. Um, with often a downward pressure on wages so that they have to work more and more. We're seeing that now. Uh, I think that's a good reason why people are sleeping less and less. And um, also the spread of, uh, you could say, um, natural exploitation into the, the exploitation of the natural world into areas that Hunters and gatherers have uh, had full rain in before, so that those environments may be less abundant and therefore requiring longer to forage in them and um, get what you need to, to have a living. So I'm wondering if you can expand your treatment of ecology along those lines. Yeah, th these are great points, um, and better said than I would have probably, um, actually. The, the three hypotheses we have for this population in Madagascar, they're agriculturalists, first of all. And we have three hypotheses for why they're sleeping so little, and I think they relate to what you're bringing up. Um, one is musculoskeletal health. We know that they have a lot of injuries and a lot of aches and pains, you know, again, related very much to the farming that they're doing. And incredibly long days. I mean, the, the work that they put in is just amazing. Um, you know, up at dawn and working all day in these fields. And we're there at the harvest time, usually. And we know from work we've done with them that they have a huge number of musculoskeletal issues, and we've quantified that. So just pain and how that affects sleep, we all know that has an effect. Um, the second thing is risk. You know, nobody sleeps well when they're at risk. And what we see in this population is they've moved into cash crops like vanilla um, and, uh, and spices and other things. And we're there at the, you know, roughly at the harvest season for the vanilla in particular, where, you know, they're, they're harvesting these crops. They're incredibly valuable, and they're storing them in their homes or they're storing the cash in their homes. And we think that that is a factor that's going to influence their sleep. Um, and so we're... we're this summer, we're going to try to investigate that a little bit more. And the third thing also relates to what you're bringing up. The third hypothesis relates to what you're bringing up, and that's just the, the sheer density of people. You know, they've they're living at a higher density than has ever been seen um, in these villages. Even though it's a village, you know, it's probably doubled in size in the last 15 years or so. But they're living in the same kind of very simple houses of just woven bamboo, but at very high density. So there's a lot of noise, 
And, you know, again, that's related to the just the, the use of the resources, you know, and the, the growing population. So all three of those, I think, relate to what you're bringing up. And we're going to be investigating this this summer. Great point. Okay. I, I think this is just basically another version of the same question, which is the kind of qualitative differences between the way we live in a modern society and a hunter-gatherer society. And I was thinking in terms of in a modern society, it's not just that we've got an Internet and they don't have electricity, but also the number of people that you come in contact with, how, how many people are involved in a hunter-gatherer society. Um, is the, are the social and um, functional roles that you have to take in the societies, are they different? And would those differences affect how much sleep you need that, in fact, you need more in a modern society than in a hunter-gatherer society because of the complexity that we didn't evolve for? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, of course, each of these societies is, you know, different. There's a lot of variation. Um, you know, they have a lot of flexibility, right, in when they're active. And, of course, in many of them, there is activity that goes on very late into the night, various kinds of social functions. And so, you know, or, or the Chimani, they're one of the groups that have studied, they're a South American group, and they do a lot of hunting, and they often will leave for the hunt, you know, sort of in the middle of the night in, in, in some of these groups. Um, and... Um, you know, there, there might be reasons for that. There might be adaptive reasons for that. There might just be cultural uh, reasons for it. Um, you know, whether those, I think we're just fortunate. You know, I think we, we have such great places to sleep and we make use of it um, because it is, it is good for us to get the amount of sleep that, you know, we try to get, seven and a half or eight hours. I mean, that's what the statistics show. Um, it's probably not the the natural condition of humans, though. And so I guess there are a lot of people in our society who sleep on a lot less than the eight hours because they're holding three jobs, you know, as was brought up or, or whatever. But I think it's surely how much time we have available in the, the soft, comfortable bed, the ability to sleep in a room that's, you know, re that, you know, is more soundproof, you know, than what we see in these other places. Two unrelated questions. First, when the hunter-gatherers or the people in Madagascar move to what we call more developed society, do they adapt to the sleeping habits of those people? And then secondly, could you tell us how animals live in the water, uh, mammals live in the water sleep? <laughs> I'm sure. Well, this is one of the things we want to investigate is how, how you know, sort of gradients of development um, in Madagascar and how that affects sleep. Um, my impression is, yeah, they move to a Western pattern uh, very quickly, but that's only an impression. And, you know, we're in a very, um, primitive is the right word, but it's a very uh, traditional society where we are, and there are all, there's all sorts of variation on that up to people living in cities, all within about, you know, 75 kilometers. And so we have a lot of variation there to work with, including people who, who you know, really do move within their lifetimes to these other you know, from one extreme to the other. Um, and so we've got a lot of variation to work with there. Um, and this is sort of on our, on our to-do list. Um, yeah, so with regard to the, the uh, sleeping in the ocean, um, you know, there has been quite a bit of work on that. And it's really pretty amazing. I mean, the, we have different lineages, of course, that have moved into that environment. And the two that have probably been the best studied are the cetaceans, um, which are known to actually sleep with half of their brain, so they have unihemispheric sleep. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether they have REM sleep or not, but it appears that they do, um, I think is what's uh, emerging from that. And so they can literally sleep with half of their brains, and you can imagine why that might be important, because they have to continuously uh, be able to breathe, right? Um, the other really amazing lineage, um, and here's, here's where more work is probably needed, um, are the, the seals, and the elephant seal has been studied in particular, um, not with EEG, and so it's not totally known what's going on, but they're reported to um, dive basically the first 200 meters they're at risk of predation, is what the thinking is. 
and they dive down and they swim very fast through that. They're out at sea for like eight months of the year, you know, six to nine months a year. They dive down, they become negatively buoyant. And on some of these dives, that with devices they put on the animals, they can see that they go into a, a, a different kind of a posture than usual. After about 200 meters, they go into a posture that slows their descent. And it's described as looking like a falling leaf, drifting like a falling leaf, and they sort of circle around. And then it appears they wake up and come back up to the surface. And this, this slowing of the descent is key because they're negatively buoyant. We're continuing to, to, to go down, right? They could end up so deep that they couldn't make it back up to the surface for their breath. Um, and in the same paper that reports this, they also have at some shallower depths, they see the animal hit the, 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 the ground uh, under sea and just lie there for a while and then wake up. And so they think that these are basically cat naps of like 20 minutes each um, that these animals are doing to get some sleep while they're, you know, while they're out at sea. Um, but, you know, there's some fascinating examples. I mean, it's just like humans. Though. This, I'm really glad you brought that up. If, if there was one, if, you know, if there was an animal that could give up sleep, right, it's, it's fun to think about this. I mean, an elephant seal would be a good bet for one, you know. I mean, why, why do they have to sleep? But it seems like natural selection, or cetaceans, you know, it seems like natural selection cannot eliminate it. And it's probably the same with humans. You know, we can, we can push it down to six, six and a half, you know, whatever number you want to pick out as the natural human sleep duration. It doesn't seem like we can go much further, but clearly we benefit if we could, right? I wish I could sleep two hours a night. Um, and I'm sure my ancestors felt the same way. And so, it, it, you know, I, I talked about those functional benefits of sleep and the functional hypotheses. I think there are real functional benefits at play here, and we need this sleep. And natural selection seems unable to completely eliminate. Yes. Hey, um, so I really have two questions. Uh, first, what what really is the point of sleep? So why why do animals need to sleep at all? Uh, and secondly, um, are humans? So from from your plot, it showed it looked like humans were or basically any great apes are basically really efficient sleepers. Um, is that the case? And is that also true, for instance, for other high functioning animals like dolphins and things like that too? Yeah, I think it's hard to measure. Um, I mean, well, with, with regards to the sort of sleep depth and things like that, it's, hard, it's rather hard to come up with a measure that's really comparable across different species. I mean, certainly the fragmentation measures that, that David had, David Sampson has, are uh, behavioral measures of sleep, right? What you really need are EG in some way to say, oh, this was deeper sleep, or you know, it, was, it was acquiring whatever that benefit is more efficiently. And, you know, people have proposed, and I've, I'm among them who have proposed this in the past, that animals, you know, ecology shapes how much time you have to sleep, and then animals adjust their sleep depth, you know, to acquire whatever benefit they need. I think that's really hard to get at. Um, at least it's not, it's not in my realm of expertise. But what are those benefits, right? And I don't think there is one benefit. Um, you know, so many different things have been piled on to the time when animals are um, in a state of rest. Um, there is some very intriguing work that's been coming out over the last several years suggesting that sleep is a time to really clear the brain of various kinds of metabolic products that accumulate over the day. And that might be the original reason for sleep. Um, but certainly there are other things that happen during sleep, and it's hard to say what is the benefit, you know? I mean, um, the immune system can be more active. Some parts of it can be more active. The brain's involved in memory consolidation processes. That's shown through very elegant experiments. Um, you know, growth hormone is released in some species, but not others, you know. And, and so what is the function of sleep? Um, it's really hard to, to pin down that. I'm, I'm sort of leaning at the moment to thinking that this, you know, the original um, driver of sleep was some kind of a clearing of the brain, you know, that's sort of an informal way to say it. But that's, that's you know, that's what some of the, the literature is. Thinking. So does, does every animal with a brain sleep? Um, I believe that that is the case. I'm not aware of one that doesn't. 
And there's even been work on jellyfish, for example, where uh, some of these jellyfish have you know, actual visual abilities and apparatus and, and you know, more neural material, whatever that is called in a jellyfish, I don't really know. And people have argued that they, you know, those animals that have more of that uh, neural processing that has to happen, even in jellyfish, sleep more. And there's a paper in the literature exactly about that. So, I don't know. I'm not aware of, a, of an animal with a brain that doesn't sleep. Okay. As an aside, E.R. Wilson claims that ants do not sleep. Huh. I don't know if he's right. Um, well, that's interesting. He, he's actually claimed that in a, in, yes. in a book. Okay. I'll have to, I want to pursue that. A lot of what you presented tonight um, relies on comparisons of human societies to one another or humans globally to other species. And I'm wondering what kind of age restrictions you could use or did use um, to eliminate noise in your data. I have a teenager who would introduce <laughs> a great deal of noise in your data. Um, it, it seems difficult to compare two societies where the age distribution of one society is a pyramid and the, uh, and the other society is an inverted pyramid. You know. Yeah, that's true. And we haven't dealt with that too much. I mean, we have looked. We, of course, have data on the people we collect data from on their age and sex and things like that. Um, we're not seeing a whole lot of variation there. And we've also looked at the, when we look at the lemurs and other, you know, any animal, you want to know what its age is because, you know, there is evidence that sleep quality, well, sleep undergoes senescence like many other aspects of the body. And it's really a, you know, it's a complicated process and maintaining sleep um, can deteriorate. And so we, we obviously want to control for that, but at this point we haven't noticed, you know, obvious patterns. But we're really focusing on, yeah, well, first of all, we don't look at anyone under 18, you know, for IRB reasons, but we're mainly focusing on people in their 20s. So we haven't really gotten a whole lot of variation. But I can't speak for all the other data points, you know, that we brought in, that we look at. I mean, like the Hadza and all the other studies that are out there that I haven't been involved with. So, good question. I have two quick questions. First of all, do you do you lose sleep worrying about not sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I some people get nervous before they talk and don't sleep well the night before. I don't have that problem except when I give this talk. Because thinking about sleep when you're trying to sleep <laughs> okay. often interferes with sleep. Okay. Okay. So yes, I would say I do. Okay. Well, do you think Pretty that likely. either me mindfulness meditation or transcendental meditation can um, take the place of sleep in some huh. instances? That's a really interesting question. I can't, you know, I'm, no, no. I'm not sure about that. Oh, okay. Um, that's just not oh. my area, but it's a really interesting question. Well, one that's more thing then. What about blue zones? People who live in blue zones, who live a long time, any, any indication of whether or not their sleep patterns are really good or whether or not all those things are just... What zones? I'm sorry. Blue zones. I don't know what that is. There are groups of people all... Well, in the United States, I think there are seven or eight of people who live in these areas where they have a long life. Ah, oh, okay. I just wondered if they slept well. I don't, I don't, I don't sleep know. too well. <laughs> I guess, would you, would you rather sleep or meditate, you know? Sleep is so easy and enjoyable, but I've never really tried the other. I don't know. All right, we have just a, time for just a few more questions, and then we'll go into the poetry section. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the, um, you know, our modern society where we don't sleep because we're essentially stressed out. We're working three jobs or, you know, aches and pains or meditation. And you mentioned the agricultural village in Madagascar where they have physical aches and pains and all just kind of signs of stress. Have you been able to or are you planning to follow up on your physical sleep research with any metabolomics work to look at stress hormones and see if there's some sort of a comparable relation between stress hormones and sleep patterns? Yeah, we're looking in, we are looking into that. I mean, it's not going to happen this summer, but, yeah, we're, we're very much interested in that and looking at melatonin and other, you know, other things like that. So, great. 
we haven't distinguished between sleep and dreaming in, in our discussion thus far. In a study a few decades ago, they awake, uh, the, the investigators awakened students repetitively when they went into REM sleep, and then they showed consistent behavioral changes, kind of a psychopathy or, you know, mild psychological distress, actually significant psych psych psychological distress in, in uh, students who they awakened whenever they went to REM. Uh, have you, do you know if that's a robust finding? Has it been reproduced? It was something we were, we were taught in medical school. I... I'm afraid I don't know about that. I mean, it's it's really important to emphasize, and I, you know, I probably forgot to do this, that you know, sleep is not one thing. It's really two things. It's, you know, non-REM and REM sleep are really two totally different um, phases. In fact, you know, REM sleep is not just deeper non-REM. You know, you actually go into deeper stages of non-REM and arouse out of them and then go into REM. I mean, it's actually really hard to even graphically show what's going on. And so you could argue you're in three states during the day, you know, wake, REM, and non-REM. And, of course, the more net non-REM at the beginning of the night and REM later in the night, you cycle in between them throughout the night, arousing briefly um, in between. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, there are many studies that they do where they, you know, obviously have people on EEGs and they wake up when, at different points, you know, um, not even just REM, non-REM, but particular points within. And ask them what their experiences are, but I think you're suggesting that this is a study that um, found that awakening people during REM actually had some lasting, I don't know how long, effect on, I believe it. I hate getting woken up when I'm, oh, they were not allowed, so they were prevented from dreaming, yeah. I see. Yeah, I'll, I, you know, I mean, clearly, you know, you can show that uh, preventing someone from going into REM has big effects on cognition, on, on memory, and other things like that. But um, I don't know about this. So. Yeah, <laughs> this is why I've never volunteered for a sleep study, you know, but then I have some guilt over the poor leaps that we're keeping awake some nights, but anyhow. All right, we have one last question <laughs> on this side of the room, Charlie. Okay. So I was wondering, uh, hunter-gatherers seem to be the, 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 the mean or the standard that, that we're comparing modern life to. So, and when we think about hunter-gatherers, we're thinking about somebody in a tropical region. But we've got hunter-gatherers in the land of the midnight sun with huge sways in seasonality. I mean, massive, uh, right? Yes. So have they ever been compared? <laughs> I do not think so. I mean, this is, it's amazing how little data there are on these questions outside of the tropics, you know, and the kinds of huge amount, you know, the huge seasonality that must happen. And um, David and I have been really looking for rigorous studies of that. I mean, there are a few studies here and there, but they don't really get at how, um, how people are modifying their phasing of sleep, you know, in a rigorous way. Um, with real data. So I think that's a, a study that really needs to be done. Um, you know, it's a great question. So. Okay, so. All right, so. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very, very much. That's, that was great. So at this point, I think what we'll do is we'll invite our poets, our esteemed visitor poets, to come up and, and uh, regale us with their creations. Okay, thanks everyone. I, I know we enjoyed the talk. It sounds like you did too. Those are great questions. Now we're gonna just kind of go down the line and share with you what we've come up with, our impressions poetically, while we were listening to the speech. Mine is called The Night Museum. When they made the great leap from the trees before me, the apes left me behind 
those leafy nests their first class tickets to a deep oblivion. Rest distant and exotic as valley high. Maybe just apes make a bed to lie in. Mine's a cage. Less for rest than watching the clock tick till daylight unfolds. I may be giraffe, my neck origami half a night, envying the dreaming hedgehogs and squirrels. May be human, but stuck, paleolithic, hunting and gathering my elusive mastodon. Shut eye. My teddy bear, my pillow, my email, my ambient. My predation. Evolved to stalk, not pray, but sleep. I'm Tara Lynn Graf, and I don't have a title for this yet, so if you um, think of anything, please let me know. We can make this more ekphrastic than it already is. Um, if humans are awake more than all primates, Maybe inducing sleep among our species would turn back evolution, loosen the spinning wheel to the missing link, a barbarian whose spine curves and fists graze the ground, who has all the answers to the mystery, if it can stay awake to tell them. But it enters and leaves our world in a yawn. Uh, my name is Bartholomew Barker. Make your bed, my mother said, but I have better things to do. Yet, as I grow old, I mean mature, I discover I prefer the dreams, flying through the trees of my ancestors, escaping predators, heart pounding as I jerk myself awake. Considering how far we've come from our nests, sleeping in concrete boxes on chemical foam, as we pollute the sky with perpetual twilight long past the setting sun, perhaps we, can, we should reconsider those better things we've done. My name is Anna Weber. Tonight, while you lie in a bed of your making, lucid dreaming of a night when you can sleep like it mattered to science, I, David Sampson, will count the waking minutes of this baboon, crouched in a corner like a big man in coach. I will stifle my own yawns to know his every discomfort, remembering how last night the orangutan put us all to shame with his majestic and obscene sprawl on the pink silk sheet spread out for him by a research assistant. Tomorrow, over coffee, I will talk with the apes, and the lemur will tell me her dreams. From this, my gift to you, who on this night sleep or do not, the sanctified blessing of the scientist on your master bedroom, the sanctuary you wish it to be, that you might not regret the evolution of candles, soft music, or thread count. Thank you so very much. That was fantastic. Everyone, right? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So that, that wraps up our, uh, our program tonight. Remember, we do have uh, science cafes following every week, every Thursday. But remember, as I said before, the building next door to us, it will be closed. So you'll have to enter and exit through the cafe doors here. So thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure. Dr. Nunn, thank you so very much.